Welcome back to section three on visceral renal artery management. My name is Guillermo Escobar, I'm the program director for Emory University, and I'm gonna kick us off with uh, management of FMD or fibromuscular dysplasia. Let's see if we can get this guy to click. Okay, so FMD falls into the category of non-atherosclerotic, non-inflammatory occlusive angiopathies. Most of the things that you're gonna see uh, involving most blood vessels are not gonna be uh, in this category, <clears throat> so it's kind of interesting. It tends to affect the medium-sized vessels. It can affect almost any blood vessel, but we're gonna talk about the two most common, one of which, of course, falls into the category of renal. It causes only 0.1% of hypertension. So if you really think about within the realm of hypertension, we think of 90% of hypertension is called essential, and then within that 10% of non-so-called essential hypertension, 10%, so 90% is anything but FMD. So FMD is relatively uncommon, but when you do find it, it's one of these cool things that you can actually treat and potentially uh, reverse uh, hypertension. It was originally described in 1938 by Ledbetter and Birkeland from the University of uh, in Hopkins, and uh, they found it in the renal artery of a young boy with severe uncontrolled hypertension. They did an angiogram, they, or excuse me, they, they did an uh, evaluation or whatever, and they took him to the, to the operating room to evaluate the renal function, and lo and behold, they found that the artery was uh, abnormal. And in 1938, you could treat abnormalities of the renal artery one way, curing it with a high quality nephrectomy, remove the kidney, and lo and behold, blood pressure got better and the kid did really well. So the etiology is really not well understood. There's essentially four big categories of uh, uh, where this comes from. And one of them is that we think that there's a sort of relative vessel wall ischemia. Uh, the renal artery, particularly in the distal two thirds, which is where the majority of the uh, affliction tends to be, is said to have less phase of a sorum. And if you look in the realm of atherosclerotic renal disease, most of it's in the proximal third. So kind of the aorta, uh, renal junction is where you see atherosclerosis, but FMD tends to be in the distal two-thirds. Uh, so they think that maybe within uh, breathing and jumping and skipping, the, the kidney bouncing up and down causes repetitive vasospasm, and that's going to lead to, to uh, damage, and then that damage doesn't heal from poor vasovasorum. Uh, there's also an association, like everything, with uh, cigarettes, so this is, again, a little bit looser. There is a hormonal uh, theory, because uh, you'll see that the majority of patients about two-thirds to 70 percent are going to be female. And then finally, there's an inherited co uh, component. There's been uh, association that's been very interestingly looked at in HLA-DRW6 and also potential polymorphisms in the angiotensin-converting enzyme uh, receptors, uh, uh, excuse me, the actual enzyme and or the angiotensin-2 uh, receptors that are abnormal. So all this has been looked at, but unfortunately nothing has really been nailed down. But what makes it really interesting is the histology, and this is the stuff that most of us immediately, there's a 40, 50 percent of you just shut down because I said the word histology, but when you see it in that distal renal artery, the most common etiology, ready? This is important for all of your testing. Medial fibrodysplasia is the most common, and you're going to forget this, but I'm going to help you remember. So typically what happens is that there's this homogenous collar, and they say collar because it's very, very focal, of thickening of the elastic tissue causing multiple stenoses. And between each stenosis, kind of like putting your finger over a hose, there's this high velocity spray that comes out and you get sometimes these formation of aneurysm with stenosis, aneurysm, stenosis, and that's gonna give you that characteristic string of beads that you sometimes hear about. <clears throat> Interestingly, the internal lame uh, elastic lamella is preserved. So it seems to be this weird hyperplasia of the media. And when you look at an actual spot where you see that thickening, you can see very dramatic how thickened that is. But then when you look at it in a transverse cut, you see that there's areas that are spared. So why there's certain areas that are thick and then spared and then thick and then spared is not totally understood, but these, this uh, intermittent thickening is what's gonna make it look the way it looks, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And about 60 to 70 percent of cases are going to involve the renal arteries, and, and that's why you're always thinking of renal arteries when you're thinking of FMD. And don't forget that medial fibrodysplasia is the most common. So the right side, for whatever reason, is more common than the left side. Uh, less than somewhere between a third to 40 percent are going to be bilateral. So for, again, some odd reason, there is some asymmetry to this, so this isn't a global sort of manifestation. Uh, uh, the presentations can be stenosis, which are going to primarily uh, be hypertension, you're going to have dissection every once in a while, you're going to have someone with flank pain for no apparent reason, then they get imaging and then you find they have a, a dissection with these little uh, abnormalities, or they can form uh, focal or multiple aneurysms. Within the, the realm of the kidney itself, 
It could have a decreased rat mass, and we think that what they do is that they microembolize. You get these sort of uh, uh, flow eddies after each one of these stenoses, a little bit of clot, a little clot starts knocking off chunks of kidney. Next thing you know, that kidney tends to be a little bit smaller. And medial fiber dysplasia is the most common. So if you look across the board, the most common uh, presentation is seen here in this, uh, in this chart. And I will call the attention to the medial fiber dysplasia, which is 80% of all the cases. Now, if you notice that the, the, the presentation, this concept of string of beads, which is, again, in the distal two-thirds, is common both to medial fiber dysplasia, but also think of a multiple choice question. Here we go. There's another medial one, the perimedial. The perimedial is actually the second most common, uh, 10 to 15 percent. And both of these will have the string of beads. And then there's some other ones that were probably from you know, pathologists that had nothing else to do, which is that 1%, less than 1%, 5%. But note that also you can have FMD, which could manifest as very long segment stenosis, which we think it's, it's, this, you know, it's a little bit more diffuse, or maybe those areas of gaps just eventually fibrose and scar down. But the point is, is that typically you're going to see the string of beads, but you can have a long uh, stenosis in a young person that could be from FMD. Now, other vascular beds. Theoretically, any vessel can potentially have FMD, but about 65% of patients with uh, renal artery FMD will also have carotid FMD. So if you're ever encountering a, a patient with renal, always make sure you look at the carotids. And uh, in the carotid, oh good, it's better up there. Uh, what you'll see is a very similar sort of a appearance of sort of stenosis and dilatation that you're going to see in the carotid. And once again, flipping it over, if someone were to be diagnosed with uh, abnormal carotid, uh, you're uh, obligated to go back and look at the renal arteries. And remember, the right is a little bit more common than the left. So make sure that if you have one, you look in the others. And you can have it in any other uh, uh, vascular bed, particularly mesenteric vessels. And even the iliac arteries have uh, been described. Um, so uh, the middle and the distal part of the carotid artery is the one that's affected. So why the internal carotid artery is the one that's affected, not the external, not the common? You know, nobody really understands this, and this, this concept of lack of uh, vasovasorum is some, one of the theories, but realistically, nobody really knows. And most of the times, if you do see it in the carotid arteries, it tends to be bilateral. And medial fiber dysplasia is the most common. So within the, the realm of, uh, of the diagnosis, typically what you're looking for is you're going to see hypertension in, in a female. You're going to see multiple antihypertensive drugs. They're in their 30s. They're in their early 40s. Um, and... Uh, for whatever reason, uh, you're finding this sort of renal dysfunction syndrome with elevated creatinine. They tend to be young. The, the sort of the midpoint is going to be right around 30, but you can plus minus 10. Remember, the original diagnosis was done in a child. So you can have a child with FMD. However, uh, traditionally, uh, you're going to see it in somewhere in the, the, somewhere in the 30s, plus minus 10. Uh, Pulsatile tinnitus is another manifestation. Or uh, unlike tinnitus, when you think of tinnitus, you think of ringing. And really what it is is, a, is an auditory, uh, um, uh, something that you hear is a tinnitus. It doesn't have to be ringing. So usually it's a whooshing. It's a pulsatile whoosh, 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 whoosh. And it drives a person crazy, particularly when they cover that particular side of the ear. It gets louder. And uh, a young person with pulsatile tinnitus, particularly if it's new onset, you should look for FMD in the carotid. Uh, headaches, for some reason, is a sine qua non for a carotid presentation. If you see uh, uh, the grand majority of patients that are diagnosed with FMD in the carotid, they tend to present with a uh, headache. And of course, the granddaddy of internal carotid artery is stenosis. It's going to be TIA or stroke. <clears throat> so within the realm of physical exam, uh, you're going to find bruies. They're kind of neat. If uh, you actually have a stethoscope, I noticed that yesterday somebody actually suggested the importance of a stethoscope in your lab coat, and absolutely nobody apparently picked that. And I, you know, I have a stethoscope in my pocket, and my boss has a stethoscope. I don't know if any of you do. But if you do, it's really cool, because you can actually hear uh, the abdominal bruise. And remember that a bruise is simply an, uh, an auditory manifestation of turbulence. So just like a flute, the only reason you hear sound with a flute is because the air is sort of being turbulent and bouncing. So a bruise is not specific, but it's kind of neat to find. Uh, patients with the so-called flash pulmonary edema, which is a 20 or 30 year old minding their own business, suddenly they develop a pulmonary edema. It turns out they're really, really hypertensive. Make sure you look at the renal arteries. So uh, as far as non-invasive screening, you know, the, the classic renal artery uh, duplexes, you're going to find these areas of, of stenosis. In this case, it's a little bit of a long stenosis, but you'll also see the sort of string of beads characteristic with a duplex. And 
like any other sort of renal uh, uh, stenosis syndrome, you're going to look for a renal resistance index. Now, the, the tricky thing here is that if you get a renal resistance index, what you're doing is that you have to get it at the point of the stenosis. And renal re uh, resistant index was first described with atherosclerotic stenosis. So what you do is you look at the end diastolic velocity in the area of the stenosis, and you divide it by the maximal uh, systolic velocity and, and make it a, a percentage. But when you have multiple stenosis, if you measure in the wrong spot, you may get a, a weird uh, number. But maybe I'm digressing a little bit too much. But the uh, diagnostic study of choice is a renal artery angiography. And when you do an angiogram, you're going to see this sort of zoomed in area. You're going to see the areas of, of stenosis and dilatation. And if you get across that lesion and measure the pressure on the other end, you should see a pressure gradient. So there should be a 10 uh, millimeter of mercury absolute systolic lower than in the aorta. So you measure the aorta, you can do it through the sheath, or you can measure uh, before and after. And it should be 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. And of course, the characteristic of a string of beads, just be careful. Uh, there's a, um, uh, if you inject vigorously into, into a very elastic young vessel, that vessel will undulate and it'll give you something called the standing wave. And that's the bolus uh, when you inject. The, the blood vessel will sort of do this. So if it looks like that continuously, then it's the real deal string of beads. But if you inject with an injector, be very careful that you're not seeing a very smooth sort of undulation, and that is not a string of beads. That is called standing wave. You'll see that in young people. Um, anyway, the, the traditional treatment, like everything else, is sort of antihypertensive therapy, antiplatelet agents. You want to avoid these sort of embolizations. And then ultimately, you're going to go to some sort of intervention. Within the realm of intervention, like everything, there's an open and endo option, and medial fiber dysplasia happens to be the most common type. If you do an open repair, most experienced renal centers <clears throat> will recommend a transverse incision. The reason you do a transverse incision is it gives you sort of this, you know, sort of like exposing a vessel in any other uh, uh, artery bed you want to see along the vessel that you're dissecting. But there's no more important area than when you're doing it on for the right-sided uh, renal artery. The right-sided renal artery hides behind the vena cava and actually behind the right renal vein. So it's actually very annoying. When somebody calls me for a consult and they say that I have a blah, blah, blah of the renal artery, I always say right or left. And if they say left, great. Because the left renal artery comes off the aorta and that's easy to get to. But the right side is a lot more tricky. The traditional treatment unlike the carotid, you'll see in a minute, is a bypass. You want to eliminate that vessel. That vessel is considered damaged, and it's going to lead to hypertension, and it's just a mess. You don't want to re-operate on, um, on a renal artery. So typically, you expose the kidney, and uh, some people like to go retroperitoneal. The nice thing on the right side with retroperitoneal is you go behind the vena cava, so it's a little bit easier. But a right-sided retroperitoneal exposure is not something a lot of people do. You can go transperitoneal. So the, the classic. Uh, way to do it is you do your renal artery bypass first. You make it nice and wide. So you do a nice little elliptical incision on your vein, elliptical incision on your artery. You go end to end. And then later put in the vein somewhere in the aorta. The important thing here is if you notice that they purposely didn't put it in the same spot. And that's because it allows you to make a beveled anastomosis on your vein on the aorta. You want to avoid uh, stenoses. If you try to put it right back on the renal artery to renal artery, you could potentially get restenosis in the area that you're working on. You want to put it somewhere in the, in the, in the aorta. So you're a little diagonal uh, a way to do it. So again, you do your reconstruction, and you click, and nothing happens. There you go, renal artery. Uh, you get uh, the renal vein. If it's on the right side, move it out of the way. If it's on the left side, you know you can just divide it and get it out of the way. The right renal artery reconstruction, like we talked about, retrocable. Oh yeah, you can also do the bypass above the vena cava or below the vena cava. The downside of putting it above the vena cava is that unless you make it really loose, so it kind of loops nicely, you're going to form a, a potential stenosis across that. Uh, uh, vena cava. Once you plump up and distend that artery, that artery is going to start to push down on the vena cava. So most people just struggle and stick it behind the vena cava. You just have to be careful when you mobilize it. And again, you go off the aorta if you can. If you, for whatever reason, the aorta is all stuck together and you can't get to it, you can also go all the way down to the iliac and you can do an ileorenal. Ideally, you want to use a saphenous vein. If it's a child, you want to use the internal iliac <clears throat> or the hypogastric so that they both grow together, number one. And number two, uh, if you use veins in kids, uh, they tend to be very elastic, little stretchy little things, and next thing you know, you have a big aneurysm. Uh, so typically, if you're doing a pediatric bypass of any sort, you want to use an arterial conduit 
uh, in the viscerals where you can't get to it later. And finally, of course, you can use prosthetic if you have no other option. Now, with a carotid open, it's, it's totally different. If somebody has FMD of the internal carotid artery, you expose a carotid artery just like you would normally. You cut into it, you grab a dilator, and you start stuffing them through the internal carotid artery, just sticking in dilators, and you feel pop, 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 pop. Yes, you just grab a stick and you stuff it into the internal carotid artery. I've actually done it. I know what you're thinking, but it actually works. And amazingly, the restenosis rate is really not that bad. So the, the, that sensation is, is really freaky, and most of you will probably not see it unless you have a recurrent case. But typically, uh, nowadays, uh, angiography is probably the way to go. Here's that case I showed you earlier with a big 15 millimeter mercury uh, pressure gradient. You get across it, you go in there, medial fiber dysplasia in this case, and uh, you do a balloon angioplasty. And lo and behold, it looks really nice, nice and smooth. And you sort of break open those little septa, and then uh, the patient's uh, pressure went down to six millimeters of mercury. So this is a case of perimedial. Remember that? How I told you there was the medial and the perimedial. The perimedial tends to be a little bit more focal, and this is a case of a perimedial also uh, dilated, and it looks really nice. So you, unlike the majority of scenarios where you, where you know that balloon angioplasty doesn't really last and you want to put a stent in, generally speaking, stay away from stents in these cases because in the long run you may have to do a bypass. All of these patients are young. So what are the outcomes? Uh, this is a publication that actually came from uh, Methodist, uh, uh, Dr. Davies and Lumsden. And what they looked at is a, uh, a, a series of uh, 21 patients on 27 patients. And um, uh, you can see here, actually, their mean average, uh, average age was 47. I would put money on the table that a lot of these patients were redos. But uh, you can see that 71% were under the age of 50. 100% uh, of them were hypertensive. Whoops. The five-year primary patency, so after you did an angioplasty, about 66% of those patients, excuse me, this is the lower one. 66% of those patients uh, uh, maintained uh, widely patent, but then if something happened to them, they were able to bring them back in 87% of the, of, the, of the time in five years. As far as restenosis, uh, about 72% of the patients uh, uh, were without restenosis at 10 years. So generally speaking, it works pretty well with balloon angioplasty, and of course you spare them the, the, the transverse arteriotomy. So uh, in the end, uh, endovascular therapy for renal FMD is effective, pretty durable, reasonable. A surgery for uh, cases that don't work or they keep coming back and or if they form an aneurysm, you have to reconstruct it and avoid stents. It'll make your surgeon hate you if you put a stent in a thrombosis and knocks off the kidney. It's really difficult. Sometimes, though, you might cause a dissection. And don't forget that medial fiber dysplasia is the most common, and you will get that answer right. Thank you very much.